So how would you describe God? If I gave you a pen and a piece of paper, would you draw something? Would you write something? Would you prefer to use some graphic design uh, program on your computer? Or would you just sit quietly and imagine a picture in your mind? If you were to draw a picture of God, what might God look like? Today we begin our series exploring the Gospel of John who focused on the question, who is Jesus? Who is God in Jesus? Throughout this Gospel narrative written toward the end of the first century is an attempt to provide answers to that question. The Gospel was written in Greek at a time when these early followers of Jesus in post-resurrection years were struggling with where they fit into the faith community. They tended to separate from the Jewish synagogue, which had been their community, because of their belief that Jesus was the Messiah. But at the same time, they had been richly influenced by the Jewish faith and would like to have remained within that community. Some describe the Gospel of John as an attempt to lead the reader to his or her own experience of Jesus, by describing Jesus in different ways through narrative and discourse and the use of figurative language or metaphor. Today we look at the very beginning of John, read by Lori, where the opening words echo the beginning passage of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And from Genesis, hear the echo of those words in Genesis. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. In one commentary of this passage from John, the author Thomas Nelson argues for the use of the word voice instead of word. He says that the reference to the Genesis story takes the reader back to before time even began, when God interrupts the silence, the void and speaks the cosmos into existence. Unlike the other Gospels that tell the story of Jesus' birth in a stable surrounded by barn animals and shepherds, John's Gospel, unique to John, focuses on Jesus as the Word, or the Greek word logos. And so the translators of this interpretation of this text use voice instead of word. So I'm going to share that with you, and let's hear how it sounds in this passage and see what kind of a difference that makes from Lori's reading from the Gospel of John, from her translation. In the beginning, before time itself was measured, the voice was speaking, and the voice was and is God. This celestial word remained ever-present with the Creator. His speech shaped the entire cosmos, Immersed in the practice of creating, all things that exist were birthed in him. His breath filled all things with a living, breathing light. A light that thrives in the depths of darkness and blazes through murky bottoms. It cannot and will not be quenched. A man named John, who was sent by God, was first to clearly articulate the source of this light. This baptizer put in plain words the elusive mystery of the divine light, so all might believe through him. Some wondered whether he might be the light, but John was not the light. He merely pointed to the light, the true light who shines upon the heart of everyone, was coming into the cosmos. Jesus, as the light, does not call out from a distant place, but draws near by coming into the world. He entered our world, a world he made, yet the world did not recognize him, Even though he came to his own people, they refused to listen and receive him. But for all who did receive and trust in him, he gave them the right to be reborn as children of God. He bestowed this birthright not by human power or initiative, but by God's will. 
It's always helpful if you're looking at a particular passage in the Bible, if you can, to get one or two or three different translations. And I know many of us uh, do not necessarily have 10 or 12 different translations on the Bible sitting on your kitchen bookshelf, but you can easily Google it. And if you just type in a passage, you can reference all, all the different, up to, I think, 50 different translations. And if you're up on Mandarin or Cantonese, you can find those there as well. So, but it, it's a useful exercise if you're looking at a particular passage to just hear how different people interpreted it. So he goes on to say that the voice took on flesh and became human and chose to live alongside us. We have seen him enveloped in undeniable splendor the one true son of the Father, evidenced in the perfect balance of grace and truth. That's a translation called the voice. For these biblical translators, the use of voice instead of word conveys a sense of action, rather than a word that we might think of as lying dormant on a page. The use of voice instead of word makes the reading seem that much more personal and distinct. Just as each of our voices are distinct and memorable and say much about who we are to those who hear us speak. And the use of voice instead of word reminds us of our faith that it is not passive, but it is active. A voice reminds us of a calling, something that demands a response from us. A voice holds power. When someone is speaking to us, it is hard to ignore and holds more meaning for us. Think of an email versus a face-to-face conversation. There is so much more that can be lost in nuance and an inflection of the voice and the expression while speaking, which emails can never really convey, even with the uh, one or two emojis sprinkled throughout your typed message. Thumbs up, happy face. This voice, this translation lifts up the fact, was present at creation. This voice exists in every living thing. This voice speaks to us like light penetrating a darkness. This voice spoke to prophets and priests, royalty and slaves, and continues to speak to us today as followers of that voice that speak to us as lives of abundance and hope. This voice came to live among us, and within us to offer us grace and truth and a more healing and transforming way of living in the world. And such a voice calls us from the wombs of our lives to be reborn as children of God, living lives of trust and faith and grace. How often have we heard a person describe a moment in their lives when things seemed overwhelming or uncertain? And they heard a voice that spoke to them to not be afraid or to give some much-needed direction or consolation. Think of the passages in the Bible, how often we hear that voice that speaks, whether it's out of a bush or a, a neighbor saying, do not be afraid. When I had my stroke, I was not able to speak for the first several hours. And I was so dizzy and nauseated and had such severe pain in my temple that I stayed pretty much in one position on my side with my eyes closed and a damp, cool towel on my forehead and over my eyes to keep any bit of light out to prevent any additional pain. In the emergency department, I was on a, well, I think they called it a bed. I don't know if it really was one, but anyway, it was flat. And... Uh, It seemed to me that I was surrounded by an orchestra of sounds and smells and busyness, but I never opened my eyes to see what was actually around me. I only remember the sounds. And one of the most vivid sounds for me was a voice that I followed as as it made its way around the room, patient to patient. When the voice approached my hospital bed, he introduced himself as the hospital chaplain. And we realized that we actually knew each other. Now, why he didn't recognize me on a hospital gurney with a towel over my face, I don't know. But anyway, I don't remember much about what he said, but I do recall how calming I found his voice in what was a very frightening and uncertain time for me. I would argue I heard the voice of God or an angel in his words. So profoundly soothing and reassuring did I find them. And even as he left my bedside, I could still hear his voice in the distance, and it continued to give me that same sense of calm and peace. In the beginning was the Word, 
or the voice. And the voice was with God, and the voice was God, and in him was life, and the life was the light of humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Another important part of this passage from the Gospel of John says that this word or voice became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Reverend Dr. Sam Wells preached on this passage and wrote, Think back to the very beginning of all things. John's Gospel says the word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. Without him, not one thing came into being. In other words, before anything else, there was a whiff. The whiff between God and the word or the voice, or as Christians came to call it, between God the Father and God the Son. With is the most fundamental thing about God, Emmanuel, God with us. And then we think about how Jesus concludes his ministry. His very last words in Matthew's gospel are, Behold, I am with you always. In other words, there will never be a time when I am not with. And at the very end of the Bible, when the book of Revelation describes the final disclosure of God's everlasting destiny, this is what the voice from heaven says. Behold, the home of God is with mortals. He will dwell with them as their God, and they will be God's people, and God's self will be with them. Some commentators speak of this idea of God dwelling with us in phrases like pitching the tent or moving into the neighborhood. This word made flesh, this voice of light, dwells with us. My Adult children tell me that sometimes they find themselves in different situations where they're wondering what to do, and then they hear my voice in their head telling them, don't do that. (laughs) Or walking away from the dinner table, they'll hear my voice saying, clear your dishes. Or walking out of their bathroom, they still hear my voice saying, hang up your towel. (laughs) Now, as much as I feel rather embarrassed that these are the things I will be remembered for, At the same time, I realize that it is a strange kind of compliment. I realize, miracle beyond miracles, that my children were listening, even though they didn't always act or do the things I might have hoped that they would. And rather than thinking that I'll simply be remembered as a controlling, nagging, interfering presence, there are times when my children will say how much they appreciate what I've taught them how supportive I've been in their lives, and how they know that all the directives and comments were made in love. Grace is a good thing. So, am I really comparing my voice with the divine word or voice of God? Well, I like to think the children think so, but not exactly. But what I'm trying to illustrate is that what we are taught the beliefs that we hold, the things that give our lives meaning and purpose, can be voiced even in the midst of challenging and hectic times in our lives. That voice or word that has been present in creation and creative ways since time began is still ready to speak and to be heard today. That creative, rebirthing voice calls to us reminds us of what has been and and encourages and challenges us to be transformed and renewed into all that we and our Creator hoped we could be. Like a mother's voice, encouraging, loving, and sometimes challenging, continually beckons us to be more, do more, imagine or dream more of our lives than we might even be able to imagine in order to make our world a better place. And that same voice promises to stay with us, be with us, pitch its tent and move into our lives like they've moved into our neighborhood to continue to remind us of who we are, where we've come from, and what our lives could be if we followed that voice. That voice that took on flesh and dwells with us. May we listen to that voice Hear that word and expect grace and truth in our lives as promised from the very beginning of time. And know that that voice, our word, our creator and redeemer, 
will be with us always, no matter where we are and what our lives have become. God promises to be with us. Let us all attempt to be better listeners, to listen to that loving, challenging, inviting, creating voice, and trust that God will be with us in grace and truth. Amen.